Okay, I'm not going to talk on kinetic theory, uh, <laughs> but um, my only expertise, I guess, on these matters is because I translated these volumes, actually, a second volume just came out by Del Noche, and I will offer some reflections about the cultural and philosophical significance of the sexual revolution relying heavily on Del Noche, because Del Noche was one, in my opinion, of the most significant Catholic critics of the sexual revolution in the 60s back in Europe, and is still not well known in this country. And uh, in the years immediately before and after, Romane Vitae he wrote extensively on the subject. While, to my knowledge, he did not address directly the question of contraception, his work on the nexus of sexual revolution and secularization, I think, is still helpful in order to understand the context of the encyclical and the deeper issues that Umane Vita tried to address. So I'm going to read my paper. Uh, in a nutshell, around 1968, Del Noce argued that the sexual revolution cannot be fully understood either sociologically or moralistically. It can only be explained as the result of a deeper and broader cultural shift namely a radical transformation of our culture's philosophical anthropology, meaning our collective vision of what it means to be human. Strictly speaking, it should not even be described as a transformation of our understanding of human nature because one of the constitutive elements of this shift is precisely the negation that there is a specifically human nature. Uh, furthermore, such negation coincides with the negation of what Cardinal Jean Danielou called the religious dimension. Uh, today, I will argue that the suppression of the religious dimension, rather than the rejection of any particular religious tradition, is a good conceptual framework to understand the sexual revolution in, in its many aspects and expressions, including ideological colonization, which is the topic that Father Antonio gave me. I will begin with, thank you for inviting me, Father Antonio. Uh, I, will, I, will, I will begin, Father Antonio married me, so I've known him for a for a while, and from time to time, you go, yeah, and my, and my wife. Uh, I will, I will be, I will be, no, okay, sorry. All right. I will begin with two premises. Ready for the two premises? Okay. As a first premise, I would like to recall briefly Del Noche's diagnosis of the general orientation of Western culture in the decades that came immediately after World War II, because in my opinion, this diagnosis <coughs> illuminates the context in which the sexual revolution started and progresses unimpeded during the quarter of a century leading up to Umane Vitae. Uh, before the war, mainstream secular culture, at least in continental Europe, had largely failed to understand and prevent the rise of fascism. After the war, it faced the double threat of Soviet communism and in some places the rebirth of religion. Think of the, for instance, in the, the power of Christian democratic parties in Germany and Italy and other places. So uh, after 1945, secular culture tended to exercise these dangers in the Noche's view, broadly speaking, by rediscovering the worldview of the Enlightenment and by repudiating the romantic reaction that had prevailed in, to some extent in the 19th century and it still deeply marked European culture between the world wars. In this, one should make a distinction between European continental culture and English-speaking countries, because you heard from Michael, a gallery of horrors about the 1930s in America and parts of England, but if you compare that with continental Europe, by large extent, continental Europe was dominated by idealism in Italy and Germany, or historicism, Kantian morality, so it was kind of behind in many respects. Uh, so, um, secular culture, in the notions you tended to exercise these dangers by rediscovering the Enlightenment. Now, Enlightenment, of course, is a very broad category that can mean many different things, but what the Noche has in mind is the scientific branch of the Enlightenment as, as a general category, the idea of a break of the past, you know, the idea that mankind is entering adulthood, mm -hmm. moving away from the dark ages. Then this can be expressed in many ways, but the one that the Noche noted after there was were the more scientific form of the Enlightenment. So when he speaks of the Enlightenment, the Noche has in mind, above all, 18th century thinkers like Condorcet, who exalted scientific and technical progress as the key factor that enables humanity to leave behind the dark ages and enter adulthood. The claim about the rediscovery of the Enlightenment does not refer primarily to academic philosophy, but rather to, quote, a confused but extremely widespread disposition, end of quote, among scholars, journalists, and artists of the generation that came of age around 1945. 
Following the horrors of the war and the Holocaust, they discover the Enlightenment, quote by the Noche, as a disposition to declare a break with traditional structures and criticize them inexorably from an ethical, political, and social standpoint. This disposition is a mixture of a millennialist element, as if a great cosmic revolution had destroyed all Europe turned into Babylon with its traditions and values, and an enlightenment element, pointing to the only philosophical road that can still be followed. Therefore, he continues, emancipation from authority and traditions in the spirit of the enlightenment had to take place according to the aspect of the enlightenment that makes negation its dominant character. There is no idol of the enlightenment that has not been rediscovered since the war and made an object of worship, science, progress, technology. This anti-traditional attitude was reinforced by another discovery, rediscovery, that of Marxism, which also came back in vogue in continental Europe after World War II. According to Del Noce, quote, the rebirth of the mindset of the Enlightenment and the rediscovery of Marxism have met and compenetrated each other. And of quote, with the result that Marxism was rediscovered in its scientific and materialistic aspect, downplaying the romantic and revolutionary aspect. De Noce famously pointed out that Marx's historical materialism in isolation, separated from the dialectical aspect, tends to become what he called total relativism. All values are reflections of material, historical circumstances and have no permanent validity. I want to give another quote by him where he says that the two aspects, uh, talking about Marx, the two aspects of historical materialism as affirmation of total relativity and dialectic materialism as the revolutionary principle must dissociate when taken to the extreme. And this dissociated historical materialism has invaded the Western world, where culture is marked by the hubris of human sciences. Hubris in the sense that they want to replace philosophy. This is something Michael was mentioning early on. Del Noce diagnosed that the post-war culture made, as it's called, the replacement of philosophy by the human sciences. And that this was then copied by Catholic modernists in the replacement of theology by the human sciences. Uh, Ubris in the sense that, they, that the, Uber, the human sciences want to replace philosophy, uh, socio philosophy, the human sciences meaning sociology, psychoanalysis, and particularly today in 1969, structuralism. Historical materialism <coughs> taken by itself concludes only to the form of total relativism that is the premise of sociologism. Sociologism is a word they use very often where sociologism is the form of thought that today is the philosophical justification for the most a-religious and also the most conservative society that ever existed, the so-called affluent or consumerist society or society of well-being, end of quote. The Marxist influence is responsible for what distinguishes contemporary scientism from the naturalistic version of the 19th century, its claim to jurisdiction on all human and social realities. The enthusiastic embrace of human sciences by the French structuralists of the 1960s was representative of an ongoing quest to, quote, dissolve man by the reduce, reducing him to a purely natural reality. After having been analyzed by structuralism, the spirit will reveal its nature as a thing among other things. Undoubtedly, this transition of secular culture to a renewed scientism after World War II took place somewhat differently in Europe and in the US. For one thing, in Europe it required a sharper break with the past, particularly the very recent past of the idealist, historicist, and Kantian tradition that had still dominated Europe, European culture before the war. Conversely, I think it would be easy to prove that American culture was more naturally predisposed to sociologistic scientism. It is not by chance that in post-war European popular culture, America, became the symbol of a science-oriented, pragmatic, forward-looking culture freed from the constraints of tradition. In 1943, after visiting New York and shortly before her death, Simone Weil had described the possible triumph of scientism as the Americanization of Europe and as an involuntary invasion of Europe on the part of America, which in turn had been deprived of its own power of the past, or, or words, by Europe's catastrophe. There was this kind of mutual dam damage. Because America, Weil said, has no past but ours. If time allowed, one should also discuss how Marxism was rediscovered differently on the two sides of the Atlantic. In the US, 
its influence was certainly much more indirect and took place, I would argue, mostly through the human sciences, which, as we know, came to tremendous relevance in this country in the 1950s and 60s. Then now just also points out that the rise of sociologism in America required that the American pragmat pragmatist tradition be to become rigorously separated from its spiritualist side, which existed. How this happened and whether Marxist ideas played any role in the process, in Dewey, for example, are interesting questions that should be studied, if they have not been already, by historians of American philosophy. Now, on to the second premise. So the first premise was this kind of the, the quarter of a century before Juana Vita. Now, on to the second premise, and this uh, renewed Enlightenment style scientist. The second premise is answers the questions, what is precisely the object of negation by scientific progressivism? Is it the past in general, religious tradition, authoritarian morality? Del Noce argues that in the history of ideas, we can identify a specific philosophical thread which runs through European history and defines it, and which is the ultimate object of negation by the New Enlightenment. He calls it, Plato, quote, Platonism in the broadest sense of the word, end of quote, and explains it in terms of the idea of participation. European tradition was defined by the idea that all human beings participate in a universal and divine reason, the logos. I'm going to, since this is the most important part of my talk, I will give two, two quotes on this point. The Noche describes this uh, as the theory of participation that dominated unchallenged from Plato until Hegel, Hegel, without being called into question even by the antithesis of, antithesis of theism and pantheism. Let us briefly linger on some of its features. Man possesses in himself an agent whose essence is divine. And this agent and the power that eternally shapes and organizes the world are ontologically, or at least in their principle, one and the same. Hence, reason's aptitude at knowing the world. This theory incurred in the greatest misfortune that can befall an idea. It became an unquestionably evident truth, something taken for granted. Second quote, all contemporary conflicts, be they are philosophical, religious, or political, boiled down to the opposition between the Platonic Christian idea of man as image of God and the instrumentalist conception. According to the former, the human mind thinks by participation, however understood, in the divine truth, so that truth and goodness remain absolutely the same for all peoples and all social classes by virtue of this participation. The instrumentalist conception regards man as an animal that uses science, language, and makes use of instruments in order to transform the world. Signs, words, and concepts being precisely just instruments for this purpose." <coughs> End of quote. This opposition between, quote, the instrumentalist conception of the mere humanness of ideas versus the tradition of participation in the logos determines to radically irreconcilable philosophical anthropology. So what, 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 in a sense, for the Noche, the distinction of the philosophical anthropology is rooted in this opposition between two theories of knowledge, knowledge by participation and instrumental knowledge. In this sense, the Noche refers to Max Scheller's distinction between Homo sapiens, who is defined by his participation in the Logos, and Homo faber, who is defined by his power to manipulate reality. When the former, former is replaced by the latter, quote, this replacement leads to the negation of the idea that there is a human nature and to the affirmation that praxis is the measure of truth. This leads to the supremacy of power in all its manifestations, end of quote. The negation of human nature, as distinct from animal nature, is followed by various other negations, such as the negation of the, negation of the very idea of tradition as the handing down of eternal truths and values, and the radical negation of authority as distinct from power. Perhaps most importantly, the negation of participation in the logos, an affirmation of purely instrumental reason, go hand in hand with the negation of what the Noche calls, following Jean Danielou, the religious dimension. Quote by Del Noce again. By a religious dimension, I mean just the following, that there is an eternal and unchangeable order of truths and values which we can come in contact with through intellectual intuition, 
in short, that there is a superhuman reality, no matter how diverse may be the ways of signifying it. Before the advent of the technological mindset that has reached today the climax of its explication, <coughs> all peoples agreed to this. And on the other hand, how could man receive the light of the true faith if nothing had been left in the name of this primitive revelation, even after sin? End of quote. So the religious dimension in the notion in Daniel Lewis is not faith and is not even, quote, Christian in the proper sense. Rather, it is the precondition that makes it possible for the act of faith to germinate in man, inasmuch as it is man's natural aptitude to apprehend the sacred, end of quote. In this sense, it is akin to the notion of religious sense, which a few years earlier had been discussed in a remarkable pastoral letter by then Cardinal Giovanni Battista Montini, later Paul VI, and then had become the subject of a book by Father Luigi Giussani. The fact that at about the same time, Danielou, Del Noce, Montini, Giussani, all came to recognize the question of the religious dimension or religious sense as crucial to articulate a Catholic response to secularization seems very significant. In Danielou's words, the religious dimension is the question to which revelation is the answer. <coughs> While in ages past the answer had been challenged, now the question itself was under attack. The new scientism, Del Noce says, due to, due to its professed relativism about values, replaces a direct struggle against religion with an indirect one, and thereby endangers religion even more, because it erodes the religious dimension until it erases from consciousness all traces of the question of God. End of quote. This was the end of the second premise. The second premise was about this idea of participation as the condensation of the tradition which had been attacked by the sexual revolution and the religious dimension as the consequence of, as, the, as one side of this tradition. Now, in light of these premises, I think it is easy to understand the Noche's assessment of the sexual revolution. He's scathingly critical of those, especially Catholics, he uses Catholics of being mentally inferior species. <laughs> He's Catholic critical of those, especially Catholics, who regard it as a mere variation in society's sense of modesty, as a loosening of morals due to affluence, technological advances, the new status of women, etc. Without denying the importance of these sociological factors, he deems them insufficient to explain the scale the radicalness and the apparent irresistibility of the phenomenon. Sexuality is so closely tied with human affectivity and with the deepest human aspirations that the cultural view of sexuality is the most direct and most revealing existential translation of a culture of a culture's of that culture's view of humanity. And to Del Noce, the contrast between traditional sexual morality and the mass libertinism, as he called it, of the modern West is a clear reflection precisely of the contrast between the platonic Christian idea of homo sapiens and the instrumentalist idea of homo faber. He identifies one person, the 20th century sexologist Wilhelm Reich, as the first author who explicitly linked the idea of sexual liberation with the negation of the metaphysics of participation. Reich explicitly advocates for the abolition of all, quote, finalistic, idealistic concepts, and identifies the full realization of human life with sexual happiness, as determined by, you get it, guess it, science. <laughs> now there is the, the Noche on Reich. The Noche says that Reich's thought is based on the premise, which of course is taken as unquestionably true, without even the hint of a proof, that there is no order of ends no meta-empirical authority of values. Any trace, not just of Christianity, but of idealism in the broadest sense, or of a foundation of values in some objective reality, like history according to Marx, is eliminated. What is man reduced to then, if not a bundle of physical needs? When these needs are satisfied, when in short every repression is removed, man will be happy. Having taken away every order of ends and eliminated every authority of values, all that is left is vital energy, which can be identified with sexuality, as was already claimed in ancient times and is actually difficult to refute. 
Hence, the core elements of life will be sexual happiness." End of quote. The close connection between the sexual revolution and scientism cannot be emphasized enough. Interestingly, I discovered that Umane Vita refers to it when it rejects the view that marriage is, quote from paragraph eight, the effect of chance or the result of the blind evolution of natural forces. And again, in paragraph nine, when it denies that love is merely a question of natural instinct or emotional drive, which is what Reich advocated, essentially. The scientific will to expunge from the sphere of rationality everything that escapes immediate empirical verification leads to a radical form of positivism in which human reality lose all symbolic significance and become dumb, mute, in the sense that they no longer speak to us of anything beyond themselves. The relationship of difference and complementarity between the sexes, for instance, for example, no longer participates in any ideal order, let alone Humanae Vitae, vita, chapter, uh, paragraph 10, obje objective moral order established by God or does not participate in any deeper archetypal reality, such as in Christianity, the spousal relationship between Christ and the church. The question of the significance of the marital act, beautifully discussed in Humanae Vitae, is voided a priori by the fact that nothing is significant because nothing is a sign of anything else. Sexuality, childbearing, motherhood, fatherhood, the human body itself, all these realities are denied any ideal or universal value and reduced to pure facts among other fundamentally meaningless facts which science can count and catalog. Therefore, any hierarchy of preferences is absurd and potentially violent. Everything is what it is. Sexual urges are what they are. Feelings are what they are. Love is love and all of them do not point to anything beyond themselves. They are just ends in themselves, or better, they are instruments to achieve the one end of well-being. Some people have argued that the sexual revolution marks the triumph of subjectivism, but in fact, in my opinion, its deeper impulse is towards universal objectification. It is hard to speak of subjectivity when free will is explicitly denied. In fact, another interesting aspect of Humanae Vitae is its insistent, insistence in paragraph 9 that love is also and above all an act of the free will. And in paragraph 10, that man's, man's reason um, ma will and must and will exert control over his innate drives and emotions. By way of contrast, from a scientific perspective, like the one of William Reich, uh, feelings, instincts, orientations are taken to be brute facts that cannot be measured against any transcendent criterion nor freely called into question. More than subjectivism, the resulting, at the resulting attitude is emotivism or instinctivism, the contradictory affirmation, because it's contradictory, of a purely instinctual freedom which produces a dizzying variety of arbitrary behaviors but does not really involve a subject inasmuch as the very idea of subject involves transcending the world of objects by participating in what Antonio Rosmini called essere ideale, ideal being. Incidentally, Del Noce regards Rosmini as the great Catholic critic ante litteram of the sexual revolution, because Rosmini predicted the final dissolution of Kantian morality, which is what happened basically, and fought the earliest form of sociologies, which was the one promoted by the French ideologues of the early 19th century, like the Studi de Tracy. And he did it precisely by inserting, quote by the Noce, inserting morality into the general system of classical philosophy centered around the idea of participation. So, reversing Nietzsche's quip that Christianity is Platonist for the masses, sexual liberation is functionally positivist positivism for the masses. Or as the, also the Noche says, the tool to turn people into masses by uprooting them from their ideal symbolic sacramental humus. It achieves among common people what the atheistic philosophers of the 19th century and the revolutionaries of the 20th had not been able to achieve outside relatively small circles of intellectuals and activists, namely the suppression of the religious dimension. Del Noce emphasizes 
that today's process of secularization must be understood primarily as a process of erosion of the religious sense, and only subsequently as a loss of faith, and that it is in this sense that sexual liberalization was its Trojan horse. In his essay on Simone Weil, he writes, until recently, one could say that faith was under threat rather than religion. Idealistic philosophies claimed to sublate the truth, the truth of faith into a higher form of religiosity. Marxism itself, in its own way, wanted to satisfy the need for the other reality, although it projected this other reality within time. What is in question today, by contrast, is the religious dimension. Official, official religious thought, this was in the late 60s, official religious thought does not have a sufficiently clear awareness of this change. In fact, there is plenty of theologians who think of adapting faith to a world that they regard as permanently, permanently desacralized and made secular by scientific and technical progress. Faith, they say, 1969, must listen to the world. But how can faith be welcomed by a world that regards the religious question as meaningless? To highlight how the religious dimension is the true target of the ideology of the sexual revolution, I would like to quote a passage from Wilhelm Reich's 1930 book, The Sexual Revolution, which the Nietzsche calls the Mein Kampf of the Sexual Revolution, mm -hmm. <laughs> in which we find possibly the earliest appearance of an idea that has since become ubiquitous. Reich almost never talks about the church, but here he proudly throws down his gauntlet and he pronounces what he thinks is the final and irresistible challenge to Christianity. This should be read with a thick Austrian-Hungarian accent, but I cannot do it, so... <laughs> okay. You will live with my Italian accent. Religion should not be fought, but any inter... This is, this is not the notch, it's right. Religion should not be fought, but any interference with the right to carry the findings of natural sciences to the masses and with the attempt to secure their sexual happiness should not be tolerated. Then it would soon be apparent whether the church is right in its contention of the supernatural origin of religious feelings. So what, the, what Reich is claiming very explicitly is that if the, if, if the revolution succeeds, we will see that the church's claim to the religious dimension, to religious feelings, religious desire, religious sense is a fraud, right? What I find most significant and somewhat amusing, actually quite amusing in the last sentence, is the fact that it is a sexualized but perfectly recognizable version of the Marxist theory of false consciousness. The big difference is that now false consciousness, instead of applying, uh, instead of applying to the economically oppressed, is applied by Reich to the sexually repressed. Religious feelings are false images of sexual desires. And once the sexual happiness of the masses is secured by the application of natural science, the false desires will disappear. In the Reichian utopia, the vanishing of religion will not be the result of direct persecution, but of the disappearance of religious desires among a sexually satisfied populace. I think that the manner in which the combination of scientism and sexualized Marxism leads in Reich to the denial of the religious sense is truly paradigmatic of the sexual revolution as an epochal phenomenon, I mean, as a phenomenon that marks an epoch, right? The sexual revolution is not just one phenomenon among many, but is the phenomenon that marks an epoch. So I'm going to read that sentence again because it's my main thesis here, okay? So my main thesis is that the manner in which the combination of scientism and sexualized Marxism leads in right to what? To the denial of the religious sense is truly paradigmatic of the sexual revolution as an epochal phenomenon. It also points to the way in which it can and will end. It will end by a rediscovery of the full scope of human desire, of its infiniteness. This will include a rediscovery that the religious sense is at work within every particular desire, so much so that P Pache, Dr. Reich, even sexual desire has a religious dimension that can only be denied at the price of either unbearable boredom or spiritual, spiritual derangement. <laughs> Finally, I'm almost done. Am I doing okay with time? Finally, some concluding remarks on ideological colonization, because Father Antonio asked about it. So, in 1970, speaking of the intellectuals who believed that the Cold War would, could be won 
by embracing against the Soviets technological progress, sexual liberation, secular democracy, scientific agnosticism, procedural liberalism, etc., etc., against all these people, Del Noce said, quote, colonization can be achieved by only one method, by uprooting a people from its traditions. Europeans have a long history of extensively practicing this method, and this was Europe's greatest historical fault. Now, oh wonder, in order to feign regret, they are applying the same method to themselves. This comment points to a peculiar fact. In recent decades, the primary target of colonization by Western intellectual, economic, and political elites have been, has been their own peoples. We may well be the first culture in world history which is keen on uprooting itself in a process that could aptly be described as self-colonization. This makes contemporary Western relations with other cultures very different from traditional forms of colonialism. For example, uh, sorry, for sure, European colonialists of the 19th century did not hesitate to uproot peoples from their traditions in the name of science, progress, modernity, and similar mythical constructions they had inherited from the 18th century. However, they generally regarded themselves as the bearers of their own more advanced and more humane civilization. The 19th century was, after all, the century of the romantic reconciliation with the past, <coughs> as the Noche said. Conversely, the new enlightenment can only export its own progress of self-disintegration. It tries to force on other peoples not the culture, but the negation of a culture. What is worse, the target of this negation is, as I've tried to demonstrate briefly, the religious dimension which all traditional societies rightly view as the foundation of their own civilizations. Undoubtedly, these two factors, pure negativity and anti-religiosity, make today's Western cultural colonialism especially ruthless and destructive. However, they also make it weak, in my opinion, in the sense of being intrinsically unable to build and hold. After all, empires cannot be built by dissolution, let alone dissolution of one's own culture. Back in 1970, Del Noce conjectured that the relentless expansion of what he called Occidentalism, or the Occidentalist, the Westernist heresy, would lead to the highest degree of both world unification and colonialism, but at the price of the social disintegration of the West itself. Half a century later, his vision has proved prophetic. Now the question is, what will fill the desolation when Europeans and Americans are finally done waging what he called the Enlightenment's war against their own past? Thank you.